Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to be honest. I made a number of dumb decisions in my life. It's probably not the best way to start a sermon, is it? But it's true. I've made a lot of dumb decisions in my life. And one of them that I regret um, to this day was my freshman year of high school when I agreed to run track. I can hardly imagine a worse form of punishment than forcing someone to run endlessly in circles, trying to beat everyone else back to where you started. I mean, who does that? But I agreed to do just that. And uh, so I started the season on the long distance group. And uh, actually, the preseason wasn't too bad. Um, our coach, Mr. Grossman, would load us all up into his truck and he would drive us out into the next county over several miles away from the school and just drop us there and have us run back to school on the snowy and icy roads. And it, it sounds worse than it was. It, it, it was a lot better than running around a track. At least you got different, uh, you know, different scenery and, and could be out away from the school. Um, but then then the season came around, and we did a couple of track meets, and pretty quickly my coaches figured out I really wasn't that good at long distance running. So they decided they were going to try me at some of the shorter distance stuff. So I, I still remember my first practice with the sprinters. Um, I, I showed up, and the coaches told us right off the bat, okay, here's the plan for the day. We're going to run five 100-meter sprints, and then we're done. And I'm thinking... That's barely over a quarter of a mile. I've been running three to five miles a day for the last two or three months. This is going to be a piece of cake. And we get breaks in between. This is going to be nothing. So we all walk down to the starting line, and the coach yells, go. We all take off. I, I, I don't really remember a whole lot of what happened during the run, but I remember getting to the end and pretty quickly realizing, man, I just beat everybody. I finished before all those upperclassmen and everybody else. I was feeling pretty good about myself, pretty proud, until I noticed some of the upperclassmen kind of talking amongst themselves, laughing a little bit, and, and kind of saying to each other, he'll learn his lesson. And by about the third sprint, I did. I realized there's a reason why nobody else took off, took off as fast as they possibly could. And by the fifth sprint, I was way in the back and I was not, not doing very well. And that track practice, I learned the meaning of that famous phrase, slow and steady wins the race. There's a reason why you don't take off at the beginning of a race as fast as you absolutely can. I also learned that um, just because someone or something jumps out in front, it doesn't mean that they're going to prevail in the end. And that's kind of the situation that we have going on in our first reading from the book of Revelation. And if you look at the, the larger context of this reading, the, the, the devil, the, the, who's depicted as a dragon, he's jumped out on top of Christ's church, so to speak, and it looks like he's going to prevail. But what our text for it today makes clear is that there is an eternal gospel that in the end will prevail over the evil one. And so, before we get to that reading, I want to take just a moment to sort of set up the context of this short reading, because the context is crucial to understanding what uh, this eternal gospel is and, and what that means for us. And so, chapter 14 of Revelation, it, it's in the middle of a, a section which begins at chapter, chapter 12 and is depicting... Um, really, it's depicting the end times. A lot of Revelation does this, but there's a specific vision. It starts in chapter 12 and, and, and goes on um, that depicts the end times. And uh, if you were here about four weeks ago when we celebrated uh, St. Michael and all angels, we looked at Revelation chapter 12, that, that, that kind of weird vision of the dragon and the woman and her seed and, and, and all the stuff that happens there. Maybe you remember it. Uh, but ju just to summarize... Um, there's, there's this dragon who represents the devil, and there is uh, this woman and her descendant. The descendant represents Jesus, who, um, who by his birth starts um, this 
cosmic battle um, in the heavenly realms that we see depicted in this reading. And eventually, Christ, after his birth, his life, his death and his resurrection, he ascends up into heaven, but the dragon, the devil, is still on the loose, and he's seeking to destroy and devour God's people who are still here on earth. That's where Revelation 12 ends, but the vision continues. And so in chapter 13, then, uh, John sees two beasts that emerge, one after the other, and they ally themselves with the dragon, and they essentially form this unholy trinity who together are trying to destroy and torment God's people as, as much as they possibly can. And regarding one of these beasts, John, uh, he says in verse 7 of chapter 13, also this beast was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. In other words, John's vision of these two beasts and of the dragon are telling us that somehow, some way, they've been given authority to torment God's people, and, and nobody on earth is going to be able to stop them from doing this. Or to use the words of Martin Luther that we just sang, the old evil foe now means deadly woe. Deep guile and great might are his red arms in fight. On earth is not his equal. There is no equal to the old evil foe here on earth. And so what? What Revelation chapters 12 and 13 are doing is they're painting this picture of the old evil foe jumping out on top of Christ's church and trying to prevail over it. And it looks like they're going to prevail over it in John's vision. It looks that way, frankly, if we're being honest, in our own lives at times. It looks like the old evil foe has the upper hand and is going to prevail in the end, but it's not where John's vision ends, because Revelation chapter 14, once again, continues the vision of St. John. And at the beginning of chapter 14, we see the victorious slain lamb, who is Jesus Christ, entering the scene to proclaim victory over this unholy trinity. And right after John sees uh, this happen, then our reading comes in, and, and he sees an angel. Let me, let me reread uh, these two verses so you can see once again what John saw. He says, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And then he said with a loud voice, Fear God. And give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So this angel comes proclaiming an eternal gospel. So what, what is this eternal gospel? Well, there's, there's really three things that are important uh, regarding this eternal gospel. First, this eternal gospel is going to triumph over evil. It triumphs over the dragon and the two beasts. I read you that verse from chapter 13 for a reason, because uh, John sees that in that verse, in, ch in chapter 13, verse 7, that the beast is given authority over every tribe and people and language and nation. But then, in chapter 14, we see that this eternal gospel ultimately has authority over every nation and tribe and language and people. Again, it seemed like the dragon and the beasts were going to prevail, but in the end, it's the eternal gospel that has the final word. Christ proclaims an eternal gospel that in the end will triumph over sin, death, and the power of the devil. That's the first thing that this eternal gospel includes. The, the second is that this eternal gospel it includes judgment. Judgment for the dragon and the beasts. Again, it looked like they were going to prevail, but our reading makes clear that it's the eternal gospel that has the final word, or as Luther famously said again from the hymn we just sang, 
He's judged. The deed is done. One little word can fell. And in the end, it is the word of that eternal gospel that will judge the dragon and the beasts and give victory to our Lord Jesus and his people. But the eternal gospel is, is more than just judgment. It's more than just triumph over evil. The eternal gospel also means a promise of eternal rest in Jesus to all believers in Christ. And that is our hope. Not just that evil will be defeated, but that we will have rest in the presence of Jesus for all of eternity. And so, with that in mind, the question that remains is where, where do we fit into all of this? Where, where do we fit into the chronology of John's vision? And, and, and I'll just be honest, John's visions in Revelation, they're, they're not clean and linear to where you can really easily pick out well, this is exactly where on the timeline we are. It, it's kind of a futile exercise to try to do that in too much detail. But the point is, what is very clear is that we exist somewhere between Christ's ascension and his second coming. And so what that means for you and I is that the dragon and the beasts are on the loose. We don't know what this unholy trinity necessarily represents, um, but what is clear is that the devil is behind it. He is the one who is trying to destroy Christ's people, and he is... He's, he's the one on the loose who has an ultimate goal of trying to avert your focus from Christ's eternal gospel. That is his goal. He doesn't care what you focus on as long as it's not that. Because if he can get you to avert your focus from Christ's eternal gospel, then your hope is gone. My friends, don't let him win. Don't let the devil take away your hope. Make this eternal gospel, which is proclaimed in God's word, the center of your life. Surround yourself by God's word, by his gospel, so that you can be reminded that in the end, the eternal gospel will triumph. The devil cannot triumph over the word of God. The word they still shall let remain nor any thanks have for it. He's by our side upon the plain with his good gifts and spirit. And take they our life, goods, bank, child, and wife. Though these all be gone, our victory has been won. The kingdom ours remaineth. In the name of Jesus, amen.